Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Laura and I discuss fixed versus growth mindsets. We talk to Nadine Carson about smart construction, the Air Force, and stormwater management. And finally, pure water does not conduct electricity. However, as the universal solvent, it dissolves more substances than any other liquid, so it's never found in its pure state in nature. Thus, it becomes electric. Isn't that shocking? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you didn't make me read that one. I, uh, <laughs> just to look on Kara's face, I wish you guys could see it. Totally worth it. Hit that music. NAP's next advanced NEPA workshop will take place on September 14th from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The series of workshops is intended to provide participants with practical tips and tools about how to refine preparation and review of environmental documents prepared pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act, also known as NEPA. These workshops introduce environmental professionals to the best practices for NEPA compliance. This eight-hour intensive workshop has been organized into six topics. Learn more and register today at naep.org. We appreciate all of our sponsors and they are what keep the show going. If you'd like to sponsor the show, please head on over to environmentalprofessionalsradio.com and check out the sponsor form for details. Let's get to our segment. Yeah, this is 1000%. And this is something we could talk about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Oh, fixed and growth. Okay. You know, I either want to have more and better good things or I just want things to stay the way they are. Okay. And they both have value, I'm assuming. No. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to figure out one on staying the same. I mean, okay, so how does that work? How do we, I mean, I understand why people get in fixed mindset. And I think we see this a lot in business in general. Like we just, um, (laughs) people, people get set and this is the way things are. And obviously the world is not, is not static. It doesn't stay the same. It does change. So, and it's not always just about change it's a big part of it but there's also it's about believing that there's enough to go around for everyone when you have a fixed mindset there's a limited amount of resources so your decisions are often based either around fear of change or fear of letting other people share the wealth and so either way when you ask if there's a good and bad mindset the fixed (laughs) mindset is generally not the way to go And then the opposite side is the growth mindset where there's enough for everybody. And so your decisions are based around giving and transparency and rather than fear. And I'm holding all my cards for no one else to see. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I think every idea is grounded in some experience. Right. So if, you know, fixed mindset happens because of X, Y and Z, how do you break out of it then? Good question. First, you have to (laughs) recognize that you're doing it. You know, I think that people who have gotten into fixed mindset behaviors, they don't even recognize that they're doing it. Right. I mean, you have to recognize that you're doing it and then you have to recognize that you don't want to be doing it. right? Right. And understand the different ways that it is. It's hurting you and not helping you. And if you read it's Carol Dweck's book on mindset Mm -hmm. and it will describe in much better detail than I'm describing any of this, but it comes down to the way that we talk to people, the way that we invite people to teams, the way that we do our work and see the world. And it makes a huge difference. And I think when you're operating in a, in a place that, that is a fixed mindset, you can't see how you're hurting yourself. Right. You know, and it actually, it reminds me, I've, I've maybe alluded to this on the podcast before, but like the beginner's mind and expert's mind, right? It's two fields in the same sphere. So as you grow, as you get older, your experience kind of takes your focus from being broad and, you know, basic understanding to really narrow, straightforward. This is what I know. The problem is you put blinders on your eyes and then you're only looking forward and you're not seeing the bigger picture. So even in really well-established, well-run groups, it's almost always really important to bring in outside influence because they have a new perspective on things. It doesn't mean you have to change everything, but it gives you more ideas and gives kind of refreshes your business stances, your business models, and you're not just doing the same old, same old. And that's that kind of how I see it yeah. when, when you start talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. It plays in a lot of different ways. Like that is a great example, I think. 
So a fixed mindset is underpinned by a belief that your abilities are fixed by your upbringing. So that's when people say like, you know, I can't do this because I have this limitation or I can't do this because, or, you know, I have friends who are like, well, my mom didn't teach me that, or that's the way, my mom is, so that's the way I am. That's the fixed that's mindset. Funny. But okay. turning that around and saying, this is what I was raised to, but I can be bigger and better than this than you have. So it's all about your mindset, which then we all know your thoughts become your ac- beliefs, become your actions. So right. if you're thinking small and thinking fixed, your actions become small and fixed. And if you're thinking big and you're thinking, I believe we all can do things better together, mm-hmm. then that's what you get. And so, but the, I think the biggest problem is just self-awareness. People don't see when they are behaving in that fixed mindset behavior. Yeah. Interesting. And you know, in my experience too, there's, it's really hard for like an outside person to influence that, right? If you say to somebody, Hey, you have a fixed mindset, you should, you know, think better, you know, it's not going to work. Right. And it almost still has to be supportive and suggestive without being demanding or overbearing and being like, you must change the way you do things. So how do you get somebody who has that mindset to kind of let go of it? Yeah. So that's really challenging because I don't think you can unless the person wants to and recognizes it. So if you're on a team with somebody who keeps coming up with that sort of mindset and those sort of ideas or wants to hold everything back while you're trying to move things forward. Well, like if it's somebody that's working for me and that's how they see things, I feel very comfortable saying, uh, okay, look, we have to reassess how we're looking at things. And sitting somebody down and actually talking through, why do you feel this way? How are you feeling? The challenge I have is kind of, you know, when you're dealing with people who are either in a different group than you or a different tier, basically. So if you're talking about the leadership of a company or something like that, or or an organization, then it's a lot harder, I think, because I I, don't (laughs) Hey, CEO, um, I know there's, (laughs) you have 10,000 employees. I understand. But let me tell you something. Um, uh, you know, you're kind of fixed mindset. It's not going to work. I, I, I like to keep my job too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro keeping yeah. uh, employment. Well, you know, to that end, I, you do have to recognize what the relationship is with the person. Can you just flat out say it? And if not, maybe you just have to do a really good job on explaining the why and the benefits, you yeah. know, why the solution you're putting forth is limiting our growth and success and why we think this alternative is better. And they're either going to accept it or not. And then at the end of the day, I know you said you want to keep your job, but sometimes you got to go. Yeah, that's true. That is true. And people wonder why my good people keep leaving. <laughs> and if you're, that's you, maybe you have a fixed mindset. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know we've talked about it before. I, I think, you know, one of my favorite memories in, in that exact realm was uh, everyone keeps leaving. All these dang millennials, they don't want anything. And you're talking to a room full of millennials. It's literally... It was 35 millennials and this guy. And he's like, these millennials don't want the same things that we did. <laughs> I'm like, why are you saying these millennials? They're right here. <laughs> it's like, I'm a millennial. What do you, what do you, I don't want, now I don't like you. You know, it's like, it was an instant, <laughs> it was an instant. I'm like, you wondering why? I'll give you a good example. This. <laughs> yeah. And that's great. totally fixed mindset. That's my generation. So this is the way I am. I can't change whether you're young or old, you know, like, that's fixed mindset. Yeah. Being able to say, we had an argument with my boyfriend's uncle at dinner the other night because he didn't want to say he's, well, he'll say it, but he does it begrudgingly to use they instead of she and her. Oh, okay. And we're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> get over yourself. Fixed mindset right there. Yeah. I'm too old to change. Yeah. <laughs> go, yeah. But anyway, I think we've beat that to death. So yes, me. I agree. <laughs> now. Perfect. Welcome back to EPR. Today we have Nadine Carson on the show. Nadine is the owner and founder of Oya Construction, which brings construction and improving the environment together in one place. Welcome, Nadine. Hi. We're so glad to have you here. And you are a self-professed stormwater nerd. So where did love of all things... Yeah. So where did that come from? Where did that love come from? So I've always been very passionate about the environment, but I also really love construction. And it's something that I've felt for a long time had to be two separate entities. I grew up, even before we had Adopt a Highway, we were cleaning up the roadside. Um, I always cared about our environment. So then when I went to into the military, they made me a stormwater manager in the desert. 
Um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I got out, I did some more things and somehow or other, I managed to put construction and environmental together. And to me, this is like the most exciting thing in the entire world because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you brought up the Air Force because I think it's kind of wild that you, you do stay more somewhere to management in the desert. I actually have done a lot of that myself. And it, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's super important because there's only one kind of rain in the desert and it's, it's either none or all of it. So how do you manage how do you manage stormwater in a desert? So it was very funny because this was at the very beginning of the stormwater implementation in the U.S. And a lot of people were trying to figure out what needed to be done, what the rules meant, and all of this other stuff. And since I was on a military installation, it is automatically federal and you have to abide by the rules and all of these other things. So everybody else around us was like, what's stormwater? And I'm like, how do we comply with the regulations of the EPA that just, you know, and so a lot of it was learning the regulations and how it would impact us. What did we need to do? Do we have to have education? Do we have to have public outreach? You know, what are things like that? But the actual nuts and bolts of managing stormwater, it was, is there erosion happening anywhere? Is anywhere flooding? Is it because it's either all or nothing? It is right. super extreme. And there's a lot of places that I got to go and visit and work with like Albuquerque, New Mexico, where mm. all their rain comes down from a mountain. And so it rains and then they flood like super fast. So it's really cool and very unique, but I did make plenty of jokes about the fact that, okay, seriously, you made me manage stormwater in a desert. Are you telling me I don't have a job? <laughs> <laughs> well, there had to be some challenges with that in the beginning. Were a lot of those just like intellectual problem solving, or did you also have people who didn't see the value in it? See, the military is funny. You don't get to say, oh, that's not important. You are told this is important. <laughs> that's it. So, um, so it wasn't like anybody ever went, this is really stupid and there's no chance of us ever having to deal with this. It was, these are the regs. Yes, ma'am. What do we need to do? And that was it. So it, most of it was intellectual. Most of it was, what does this mean? Talking to state regulators, talking with EPA, like, what do you mean by this? What's the meaning of the word shall? Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> seeing what the regulations meant in real world, like, these are great lofty ideas. What do they really mean? Yeah. I love that you mentioned that too, because I really think people that have this understanding, you know, this assumption that the military just doesn't do environmental, but they're some of the best stewards in the, in the country and maybe even in the world sometimes. Like, Eglin Air Force Base, having the biggest woodpecker population, for example, you know. So do you have any other examples of how the Air Force has done some of those really important environmental policy updates? It's, it's really phenomenal. And I agree. A lot of people think that, like, we go over and rape and pillage the, the land, but that's not true at all. When I was stationed up at Andrews Air Force Base, I worked in NEPA a lot. And so everything that we did on a military installation had to go through a NEPA review. And we were very closely looking at everything. What are the impacts? Do we need to do any kind of EIS or an EA? Or does it fall within one of the other things? So I think projects are more closely scrutinized and looked at closer because they are looked at as a standard. Like you're supposed to be doing the right thing all the time. Right. That's really cool. I'm always curious, and we'll follow up on this before we jump into talking about your company, but what made you join the Air Force to begin with? And prior to that, did you have a love for the environment or anything, or was it just, just a happy coincidence that you got thrown into it? So my story is super weird. I love, love the it. environment growing <laughs> And I, like I said, I always was, you know, wanting to make things pretty. And I got very upset with trash, like the basic things. Mm -hmm. But like in the 80s, nobody was like, ooh, recycling. Yeah, this nerd was. Brick in your tank. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So, so I always loved that. I came from a very beautiful place out in the country. And that was something I cared about. I wanted things to stay beautiful. And I wanted to protect our wildlife and all of the beauty that was around us. So when I went to school, I went to school on an ROTC scholarship for the Air Force. So there's how I wanted to go into the military. But I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I knew that I was really good at math and I was really good at science. And I had been accepted into one of the best universities in the country. And I applied for engineering physics because I liked physics. And the Air Force said, yeah, you're going to be an engineering physicist. Where in my head, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to fly jet planes. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, go Eagles, and started in engineering physics and then realized very quickly I am not as smart as I thought I was (laughs) and had to look at everything again, like what do I want to do? Why do I not like physics? What do I like? What don't I like? And that type of thing. And I found civil engineering. And I said, wait a minute, you mean there's actually an engineering profession that deals with construction? Sign me up. I'm there. Um, So I learned more about civil engineering. I had an amazing professor that basically, his wife taught me my very first environmental class. And I said, I really want to do more environmental work. And so he said, let's set your program up to where you can do a lot of electives for environmental. So although I didn't have a minor in it, that's what I put all of my electives into is different aspects of environmental work. So it was something that was always important to me. And I kind of always thought it was going to be one or the other. And I was very excited when I got in the military and I was able to kind of do both at different times and see the different aspects of it. But um, yeah, there's no really good straight line. There is, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, 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 all over the place. Like, just there's no straight line. I'm, I'm all over the place. So it was a happy coincidence. <laughs> awesome, that's great. And then, at what point was it after you left the Air Force? I'm assuming that you started your own company. Oh yes. So I got out in 2005. God, I hate saying that because I realized how long. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got got out of the Air Force in 2005, and I worked for other people. That's what I was like, okay, I'm going to go into all these different companies and I'm going to do really great. And I'm going to make these people a lot of money. Hmm. Never thought about starting my own company ever. I worked as a contractor. I worked as a geotechnical engineer, which that means you play in dirt. (laughs) Um, I did all these really amazing things. And then I had an opportunity to work with an engineering group where they said, do you know anything about stormwater? And I busted out laughing and said, I used to manage stormwater in a desert to which they looked Mm -hmm. at me physical and said, you manage stormwater in a desert. (laughs) Nick. Um, So so then um, we had this idea that this was starting to impact some of our clients on construction sites and how do we help them out with that? And so I started a stormwater division for this engineering group and I was there for eight years and I got super frustrated about being able to tell people things were wrong, but not fixing it. So Mm -hmm. they would be very busy. They would have other priorities. They wouldn't have enough personnel, whatever. There's valid reasons, but you know, as a, as an environmentalist, I'm looking at it going, but you're tracking mud off the site. And so I got really frustrated about not being able to fix it and not being able to give them solutions. And that was where Oya Construction was born. Awesome. You and Shannon Olkers, our last guest, who's been on twice, problem solvers. I love it. Yeah. Um, which really, if you own a business, you, you have to be a problem solver. So that's awesome. So the name of the company is, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Construction. <laughs> I said that, which I'm like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, so I love it. Um, I'm, but I'm sure that's, it's, oh yeah. Is that right? So it's where Oya. did the name come from? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So Oya is the African goddess of severe rain events. Ooh. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> we all learned that at the same time. That was right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that is something, you know, I had a lot of people go, do you really want to have a name of your company that has that many vowels in it? And, and then you said, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah I do. Um, but it's also something that sticks with people, which I love. You know, once they hear that, they're like, ooh, stormwater goddess. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. So that's yeah. how I got the name. Yeah, well, stormwater is a really, it's a really important thing. So, so often I've seen so many examples of where it kind of becomes an afterthought or it's put in the back burner. And the, you know, you see, for example, you know, I'll show up and be like, hey, this road is washing out. If you don't fix this, you won't have a road. And they'll be like, yeah, sure. And then six months later, a huge storm event happens and there's no road. So that happens sometimes. I've seen hilarious mitigation where they put up a silt fence that has two inches of clearance underneath it. You're like, why did you even bother? I'd rather you not put this here. Um, So, so I I did it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So how do we get better at that? You know, honestly, I think a lot of it is just letting people understand why they see this as something they have to do, not as something they want to do. And they don't connect it with why it's important. So what I always like to do with, especially a lot of contractors that are like, this is stupid. Is I say, do you go fishing? And they are like, well, yeah, why? And I was like, 
Do you hate it when the river's muddy and all your fish are in there? Yeah, I hate it. Do you know why it's muddy? It's mm-hmm. cause of sediment leaving places. And so when I connect it a little bit more, then it makes it important to them. Or people don't understand that stormwater in most places are not treated as at wastewater treatment plants. It goes directly into our creeks and rivers. So a lot of people don't even realize that. And so they don't see the importance of it. They think, well, it doesn't matter if there's oil on here. They'll get it out at the treatment place. No, it doesn't. So I think a lot of it is educating people and letting them know because I've been doing this for a while and I'm always surprised at the lack of knowledge on most people's, they put a stencil on the thing and they're like, I don't understand why there's a stencil on this. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't connect for them. When you throw a cigarette butt on the ground, it is going into our river. (laughs) Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think the other side of that too, is when people see a construction site in general, they assume, oh, this is ruining the environment. This is bad for everything. Um, So I I do think we've gotten a little bit better with emerging technologies and practices to improve how we build. Are we going in the right direction? I think so. But the thing that I, I hope that we're putting as much energy into in developing all these new technologies is also having regulatory agencies realize like they need to realize how things are really built and builders need to understand why the regulatory authorities are saying this. So oftentimes I find it's like a versus, you know, contractors don't want to do this because they're being forced to regulators say, do this because I told you to. Instead of, well, why can't we put this there? Does that make sense? Instead of using a little bit more common sense, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen silt fence on the top of a hill. (laughs) And the last time I checked, water does not flow uphill. (laughs) When a regulator wanted to feel good about it and they said, put silt fence around the entire site, which is a waste of resources. And all that does is make the contractor angry and not want to do it. So, you know, I think that we're improving and I think that more regulatory agencies are starting to ask these questions of, is that really a good idea? And they're starting to actually listen to one another. I have a lot of contractors who now understand why I'm passionate about the work that I do and how it impacts their development. So yes, I think we're moving there. I think there's a lot of really cool proprietary systems out there that are so fascinating because once again, I'm a nerd. Um, (laughs) Fascinating to learn about and how they work and all of these other things. But I think that we need to continue looking for other options and not just hey, silt fence, it works, period. Um, I think we need to continue looking for alternative resources, alternative things that we can use. How can you stabilize your site better? Because if you seed in July in Virginia, it's not going to grow. So how do we make it better? That type of thing. Yeah. So what are some of those technologies? What are some of those things that you're seeing that you're really excited about? Let's nerd out. Why not? Yay. I love it when people let me do this. Um, (laughs) So everybody, like, I am in Virginia, and Virginia has a book. We call it the Green Book. It's our erosion sediment control measures book, and this is what says this is how you build things. And it was written in, like, 1996. And I'm very excited that the Commonwealth is now looking at redoing this book, but right now, let's just say it's old. And (laughs) it says, okay, construction entrance. You put down fabric, you put down stone, you make it this long, this wide, that's it. And I don't know how many construction sites you've been on and they do it. And then it gets choked in with mud. It starts tracking out. There's stone in the streets. There's everything that could possibly go wrong. They don't put the fabric down because they don't, they don't want to do it or they do it perfectly. And then they keep throwing stone on. And through the course of the project, you get like a lot of layers of extra stone. Then at the end, what do you have to do with that? You have to rip it all out and dispose of all this. So there's this really cool new technology. I am not endorsed by them, although they should sponsor me. (laughs) Um, There's this really cool thing called FODs, which anybody in the military and the Air Force knows that FOD is for an object debris or airfields. So they actually named their product FODs mats. And it looks like, for lack of a better word, a large Lego mat. And (laughs) it's got, um, I used to actually have a little sample in here. It's got raised triangles on it. It's plastic. It's like a hard plastic. And you put them down on the ground. And as the tire rolls over it, it beats the mud off of it. You're not tracking off stone. At the end of the project, you pull it up. 
and you go and put it on another site. So you reuse it over and over again. We're reducing waste that way. We're not putting down stone and stone and stone and throwing it away. It's faster to put it in labor-wise and maintenance-wise. So things like that, I think, are amazing. And that's what I wanted to base my company on is how do we do things smarter? Now, here's where contractors are, you know, because you're like, why would anybody do it the other way? Because mm-hmm. one, they don't know. Or two, those things are expensive, mm-hmm. which is why Fod should sponsor me and just give me a whole bunch. Of <laughs> <laughs> there. Um, but they're expensive. So you have to make the investment into it. And it's cheaper to put down stone at the very beginning of a project. But how many times are you going to add stone to it? What about the labor that's involved? What about this? And a lot of a lot of contractors don't look at the lifetime cost of things. They just say, how much is it to do this initially? And then they fight along the way. Uh, no, it's fine. I don't want to put money into that. Everybody needs to make money. I mean, flat out. I understand this. And I'm never going to dog a contractor because they didn't want to do something because it's not in their budget. They need to make money. They need to pay people. So I get that. Yeah. So that's one. I've got all kinds of them. Seriously. Yeah. What's another want one? I want to hear yeah, one. give us another one. Okay. <laughs> See, at this point, people are usually like, I need to go find someone else. And they want to play. That's why we have this podcast, though. We're all, everyone listening, we're nerds. Everybody yeah. wants like, ooh, cool, environmental advancements. Let's hear it. That's yeah, so yeah. cool. So right now, I'm a big advocate to finding out how we can use hemp in erosion and sediment control measures. How is it that we can use coconut fibers? How can we use things that will break down organically instead of plastic everywhere? How can we reduce our footprint for waste and carbon and all of these other things? So recently, I started working with a supplier and getting hemp herd, which I had never heard of. (laughs) Um, But... So it's, it's basically like the stalk of the plant and they grow this industrially and they make it into mulch. So imagine mulch, but it is super, super light. So it's easy to transport. It's easy to spread. And I get some that's super, super fine. And I spread it on the site. And this is what goes back to this temporary stabilization. So when you're done with your grading, you need to protect that from rain. You know, if if a rain comes, is it going to wash off? If you leave dirt exposed, yeah, it's going to. It's going to create erosion reels. It's going to have all these other things. So one of the things I'm experimenting with is actually scattering this hemp herd, very finely ground hemp herd on site. So it will protect the soil. It doesn't wash away like hay does or it doesn't fly away. And it starts biodegrading. So if we spread this all over a site in July and it has months and months and months, it's gonna actually start adding more organics into the soil. So that when we're ready to seed for permanent, we're gonna have a little bit more organics in there. As far as I know, nobody else has been like, hey, let's use hemp for this. But I recently brought a lot of regulatory personnel out to my site and said, hey, look at this. And they were like, oh, that's going to blow away. And I was like, it's been here for eight weeks. And they're like, oh, well, it's going to wash away. And one of the guys is like, it has not moved since they put it in. Like one of the guys drove by there all the time. He's like, we've had massive storms. And every one of them said, wow, never would have thought about that. But it looks like it's working really well. So I think that there's a lot of alternatives out there. Some of it is, how can we use things better? Some of it is, somebody made a better mousetrap. Let's look at, you know, utilizing this other measure. But it takes people actually sitting there and thinking these things through. And it also takes regulatory agencies to have an open mind, to say, oh, look, this isn't exactly what they've specified, but it works. Or just let's try it, right? Like, you have to be, you have to get permission to try it, don't you? Yes, Yeah. So that's. So I'm very very lucky that I know a lot of regulatory people in this area. And so when I say, hey, this is a really good idea. Can we try it out? They know that I have the best interest of the construction project and the environment. And a lot of times I get a little bit more leniency um, and I tell them, hey, if it doesn't work, we'll pull it out and do it your way. And I really hope that doesn't happen because I don't. (laughs) But. um, but most of the time people are like, okay, we'll give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, that's all stew problems because I believe the hemp stocks are a waste product, right? So it needs to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. There you go. So 
and I'm I'm trying to learn more about it. And everybody's like, wow, you really are a hippie. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I am trying to learn more about the industry and about industrial hemp uses and how we can incorporate it and stuff. So it's really been fascinating. It's been a great, I went down a lot of rabbit holes <laughs> uh, learning about this stuff. So I bet it's one of those things where it's just like, is there anything hemp can't solve? <laughs> it's nice to work for everything. <laughs> I mean, it's great for phytoremediation. <laughs> like I got super excited one time talking. There was a, she's a hemp activist in our area and uh, she's brilliant. And she was like, oh, we use it for this, this, and this. And I was like, well, environmentally it does this, this, and this. And she's like, oh, it's so magical. <laughs> so, yeah. Love it. <sighs> That's awesome. Yeah. So speaking of storms, storms are getting heavier in some places, disappearing in others, popping up in other places where they aren't used to having rains. How is climate change making your work different or more challenging? It's not always that it's not going on places. What we usually find is that there are longer times between storm events. Mm -hmm. So with the heating up of the atmosphere and everything, it's, there's more water that's evaporating, more getting up there. And then when it comes down, it comes down massively. So the quantity of rain that's coming down is so much greater. Like we don't normally have these nice little gentle rains. We have storms now and it dumps a lot of water in a very short amount of time. The intensity and the duration of these storms are, are increasing along with the drought in between. And that's also very problematic because when the soil is so, so, so dry and it gets all of this water at one time, it can't absorb it. And so it runs off. And that's another part of stormwater pollution. But it also is really impacting how these sites are constructed and designed. So most engineers design sites based off of rainwater standards from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we anticipate having six inches of rain over, you know, and storm mm -hmm. events won't be more than two inches of rain. And they design for that standard so that when we have these huge rain events, the erosion sediment control measures get blown out. Yeah. And it has, I mean, they say, oh, look, you know, you just contributed sediment into this wetland. Well, we put those measures up as it showed on the plans. And yeah, they did. And they maintained them and they did all these other things. So I think that standards need to be changed. I think we need to be looking at not just our site, but we need to be looking at what's upstream, what's downstream. How are we going to impact people below us? How are we going to improve impervious surfaces to be able to absorb more water? It's so challenging to try to explain to somebody why, even though they put these up exactly as it's supposed to, why it failed. And if God forbid they go, climate change isn't real. Then you go, so what'd you think of the storm last week? It's super challenging. And I think it's probably one of the largest issues that's affecting stormwater right now. Yeah, I can imagine. I know you mostly work with construction. Do you have any advice for listeners on how they might be able to mitigate stormwater runoff in their homes or their business? <gasps> of course I do. <laughs> I'm a water nerd. Um, take a step back. And I used to always say, there's two ways of looking at things. Number one, if I were a raindrop. So if you were a raindrop and you fell on something, what would happen to it? Are you washing it away? So if you think about like cigarette butts and things like that, what would happen? It would wash away. If you fell into liquids, what would happen? It would wash away. And then also if a massive storm came, what would happen? So if you have, let's say you're digging up something in your backyard and it comes a huge storm, what's going to happen? Is that dirt going to run off? Is it going to do something else? But the other really important thing, and this is shocking, everybody get ready for it. Water flows downhill. <laughs> it does. I know it's shocking. And I say this because I can't tell you how many times people are like, my basement is flooding. And I go and I look and I'm like, your downspouts are directed to your house. Where do you think this water is going to go? And so it, look at things from a kind of a common sense aspect of water is going to flow with gravity. So my downspout's too high in elevation, so it's not flowing. Is it pointing water away from my house? Are we concentrating it too much? And I mean, there's so many awesome ways of doing things. So there's a lot of places that are now doing a stormwater fee. So municipalities will basically 
You can't say tax. You can't say fee. They will assess <laughs> a uh, amount of money based off of how much impervious area you have. So that's sidewalks, driveways, roofs, sheds, anything. Based on that, X amount of cents per acre square footage. And then you pay that every year. And a lot of people are upset about that. But our stormwater system has not been, it's not caught up with anything. We haven't mm -hmm. kept it updated. We haven't kept it taken care of. And then everybody grumps about flooding. That's a whole different story. Yes. Um, so, but this is what this money is going towards is it's helping us maintain our storm systems. So if you want as a homeowner to lessen your impact, can you use something that will absorb water instead of running it off? Can you put your run off from your gutters into a rain barrel. That seems to be like the big exciting thing. And then you've got water to use for your plants later on when it's dry. Can you use a, a storm garden? Can you plant vegetation that will help keep this water on site instead of taking it down to your neighbor? So anything that you can do to have that water percolate back into your ground is the best thing that you can do. So the the it used to be get it off site and make it go away fast. Now, if you can keep it on site, that's the best. Okay, awesome. And inclusivity in the workplace seems to be very important to you. Where does that stem from? And why do you make a point to include that in your work? I have been doing construction and environmental work for 22 years now. And I have to applaud you for being a woman working directly in construction. I mean, let's just call that what it is that has to be hard well, <laughs> some days you know, it's really funny because most of the time it's not yeah. and you know i had two women that i hired in my last job that are amazing and one of them was like if i get asked one more time what it's like to be a woman in the, on a construction site i'm going to punch somebody <laughs> um, i do my job period end of story and it, it's one of those things so i've seen really great examples. I've seen really awful examples of how diversity is treated in construction. I think that everybody wants to focus on women in construction, but what they also need to look at is at risk youth. Maybe they could be going into construction. What about different types of demographics? Are we seeing enough BIPOC representation? Are we seeing gender nonconforming? Are we seeing different sexual orientations? I think things are getting better. I really do. But I want it to be where if you go to work, you don't have to automatically not consider construction as an alternative. So as a little girl, do they say, I could be this and this, or I could work in construction, or I could play with these trucks. Are we making it to where it's no big deal? And right now it's starting to get there, but I want to create somewhere where you don't have to be part of yourself at work. I want you to bring everything about you to work. I want you to be comfortable and talking to me about your family, no matter what it looks like. And especially in the South, I think that a lot of times there's a lot of good old boy mentality and that's harmful. It's harmful when you're on site and people make a racist joke. It's harmful when people make jokes about sexual orientations. It creates an environment that is hostile. And I love construction. I love everything about it. And I love how much it's improving, but it has been hard a few times in dealing with some of that mentality and some of the, well, you can't do that. Actually, yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, so I think that inclusivity and diversity in construction it's one of the biggest things that we really need to tap into. There are so many amazing people that should be in our industry that aren't because of either bullying or they don't see it as an option. So that's something that is, I'm very passionate about. And just doing that work and talking about it and showing your interest in it, I think is, is a part of that change and solution. So that's wonderful. Thank you for being here and sharing with us. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if you can't tell, I really love what I do. Uh, it's so exciting. And I like every day, you know, you get bored with the, the same old, same old. I've been writing a proposal this morning and it's boring. But then <laughs> you start talking about why you're doing it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the coolest job in the entire world. Yeah. So 
having a chance to talk to people about it and let them really understand what it is. And it's great to be able to, you know, bring it up. By the way, I'm also a woman that works in construction. No big deal. Um, Mm -hmm. It's getting better. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. One of the the things we love to do on the show is to kind of give people like a full range of who a person is, right? So you are an environmental person. You love stormwater. You also have pretty unique hobbies and you used to play roller derby, for example, right? It's a wild and intense sport. So what was that like? (laughs) What what drew you to it? So uh, when I moved to Roanoke, I didn't know, I got out of the military and it's really hard for me to get out of the military to figure out how to live in a non-military world. So when you go to a new base, people are like, oh, look, new person, let's bring them in. When you move to a new town and you don't know anybody, it's really hard to figure out how to make friends. And I was working at a contractor. So like everybody that I worked with, I was like, I don't know, 25, 26 at the time. And everybody I worked with was in their fifties and white and male, period. (laughs) And so at the end of the day, they would go home to their families. And I was like, this is boring. I need friends. I need friends like me. And I had a friend visiting from out of town and we went to go eat pizza at my favorite place. And I looked up in the window and there was a flyer that said, are you over 18? Do you have health insurance? Are you aggressive? When I was like, yes, <laughs> all of those things. Um, and so it was like, you know, come and talk about uh, roller derby. And so that's the reason I did it. I liked skating when I was a kid, but I hadn't been on roller skates in forever. And I was like, how bad could it be? Yes, it was bad. <laughs> or like Bambi on ice, bad. Um, <laughs> but those women were. I mean, this is back in 2005 when roller derby was just really starting to get out there and we were kind of coming up with our own rules and our own thing, but these women were strong and they were brave and amazing. And I've gotten some of my absolute best friends of my life from there. Every summer we get together, we are scattered all over the U S now. And once a year, we all come to one place this year, it's St. Louis in a couple of weeks to be together and celebrate each other. But when you talk about needing support or needing somebody to understand you, those are my girls. And I mean, it was fun. You got to skate around hitting people for Pete's sake. Uh, And at the time we did it in like fishnets and short skirts and it was just fun and it was very punk rock. So um, (laughs) it was, it was a great experience and I really loved it. And it was really funny because I very much kept it away from my professional life mm-hmm. until it kind of took over everything in my life. And then my <laughs> clients were like, I'm sorry, you do what? <laughs> uh, it actually became a really good kind of marketing thing for me because people were like, oh, yeah, the girl who does roller derby. And I was like, yeah, also known as Nadine. But, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, it's fun. It's cool. It's, you know, and then I chattered my leg and decided maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. And <laughs> But, you know, it's something that is a huge part of my life, you know, my history. Yeah. It's a very practical decision you made. You know what? Yeah. Uh, now that my knee is gone. Um, yeah. yeah. Small things. Yeah. Small things, right? But uh, so you also, <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah. You also, uh, you went back to school to pursue a master's degree while you were working as a stormwater or pro- program manager. And, yes. you know, we hear some of those stories here and there, but that's, it's a really challenging thing to do where you have, uh, you're working and pursuing a degree. So do you have any advice for people trying to do that? And maybe like, how did you handle that time management? My advice is have a good support system in your life. I'm very lucky that I had a partner that was, hey, you study, I'll make dinner. You have this paper coming up. Don't worry about anything at the house. I've got this. I had a really great support system. And I was convinced like this is how much I've got time this is the time period I'm going to get this degree and I focus very hard on it and I was like that's that's all I'm going to do I'm very lucky for that I think a lot of people go and they're like well I'll take one class and then I'll take another class and it's st- it drags it out forever and how do you keep that motivation when you're like oh, this is never going to end and it's taking forever I met some amazing people in my program that it was based more on adult students versus you know, people straight out of school. So it was really interesting to be able to put real world experiences into class and talk with, you know, people about things and to be able to use those, my experiences, my life lessons in schoolwork and vice versa. (laughs) 
I say that you need to stop your life while you're doing it. At the same time, we also bought a house and renovated during that time period, which was the <laughs> stupidest idea I've ever had in my entire life. I was like, nope, we're not until I get out of school. We're not doing anything. We're not buying a house. We're not doing, you know, and then I was like, oops, we found our perfect house. Let's, <laughs> let's do this while I'm in grad school. Why not? So, I mean, you can do other things, but for that semester, I only took one class because, you know, you got to have something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But are, yeah, I mean, it's house. great. It was wonderful. <laughs> So, but my house was always very, very dirty and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you got to sacrifice something <laughs> or something exactly. to give, as they say. Is that where you met Kara? Yes, it is. Oh, awesome. So, we did a whole lot of online stuff and you kind of got to know the same people that you're in classes with. And so like every semester you'd like look at the, attend, you know, who's, who's in my class and be like, oh, yeah. hey, I remember you from, and it's funny how close I feel to people yeah. and have never met them. <laughs> Kara? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is very cool. So glad we're connected here. Well, we're at the end of our time. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we let you go? Don't give me open ended questions like that. <laughs> I, I talk a lot. Talk is taking 60 seconds. No, what do you got? <laughs> you're like, oh, I'm going to go to dinner now. It's been five hours. Stop. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that everybody should have open minds to learning more about environmental impacts of, of everything. There's a lot of discussions about hybrid vehicles and which is better, gas or electricity that's derived by coal plants. There's not going to be a one size fits all answer to anything. I think that you have to look at it holistically. What is my impact doing this? How can I do something that makes the world a little better? People try to minimize their impacts, but that is the only way that we're ever going to get anything done is by all of us making our impact and also try to hold corporations and stuff like that accountable. So money drives everything. So how can we help things be more cost-effective to make it normal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. And then where can people get in touch with you, including, you know, the FODS mats people? I'm sure they're just dying to call you now. So you really um, should. Yeah. <laughs> where should people uh, reach out to? My website is www.oyaconstruction, O-Y-A, construction, all spelled out, dot com. I'm also on LinkedIn as Oya Construction and on Facebook. So there's all kinds of ways. Plus, you know, my name is pretty unique. You Google Nadine, N-A-D-E-A-N, -E and Oya, and I betcha you'll find me. <laughs> um, but yes, I want to talk to people. I love this stuff. I love yeah, doing yeah. podcasts. I love expressing things. So please call me and sponsor my company so I can do cool things. <laughs> <laughs> love Perfect. it. Thanks, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, for joining us today. It was a really fun conversation. Really enjoyed it. And you can check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody. Bye.